we're reading about Gideon in the book of Judges. And in some ways, <clears throat> he showed good leadership and he was a good example. And in other ways, as we're going to see in this chapter, he was filled with vanity and vindictiveness and was not a good example. And so I think one of the takeaways that we should ask ourselves after we look at this chapter is what kind of an example am I to the people in my life, particularly the young people in my life? Am I a good example or I am, a, am I a bad example? I think about future president Calvin Coolidge, who was invited over for a meal and he spent time with the family and enjoyed the meal and then he left and the host of the meal said i like him i think he'll be a good president someday and other people said no i don't think so he's not forceful enough he's not outspoken enough he's not outgoing enough and a little girl at the table said i like him and they said why and she said he's the only one who asked about my sore finger <laughs> so he was a good example because he showed that he cared about the people that he hoped to be the leader of someday. And so I think we should always strive to show that we are good examples by the way we care about others. And sometimes we see that in Gideon, and sometimes we don't. Let's pick up the action. Judges chapter 8. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, well, why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? How come you only took 300 people with you to go up against the 135,000 person army and you only called us in Judges 7 verse 14 to chase them after they had already started running? Why have you treated us like this? And they criticized Gideon sharply. Verse 2, but he answered them, what have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abiezer, my own family? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? And that was a very gentle answer. Proverbs 15, verse 1 says a gentle, a harsh word stirs up anger, but a gentle word is what is needed. A gentle answer turns away wrath. And he's saying, you know what? God's the one who did all the work. And you actually had more of a part than I did in a way because you're the ones who caught the ore of Benzeb. And at this, their resentment against him subsided. Verse 4, Gideon and his 300 men exhausted. Yep. Keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it, you know, because they're fighting this huge situation all by themselves, you know, the 300 man army. And Gideon said to the men of Sukkoth, Give my troops some bread. They are worn out, and I'm still pursuing the kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna. Help us out. Verse 6. The officials of Sukkoth said, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your troops? Whoa! What's this lack of hospitality and harshness after what God has been doing? It's possible that they feared reprisal. If Gideon's exhausted 300-man army can't overcome the leftovers of the Midianite army, and they supported the Midianite army, the Midianites are going to come after the men of Sukkoth. And so perhaps they were just not trusting God, or they were hedging their bets, not willing to show that they supported the uprising. But it made Gideon infuriated. Verse 7. He said, just for that, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, I will tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. So we see the vindictiveness and the anger of Gideon. Verse 8, from there he went up to Peniel, which means face of God, and made the same request of them. But they answered as the men of Sukkoth had. We're not going to commit ourselves. We don't know that you're going to win. We don't want the Midianites to exercise revenge and reprisal on us 
because we supported you and you lost. From a human perspective, I kind of sort of understand that. But Gideon did not. So verse 9, he said to the men of Peniel, When I return in triumph, I will tear down this tower, the vindictiveness of Gideon. Verse 10, now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor with a force of about 15,000 men. That was all that was left of the armies of the eastern people. 120,000 had fallen by the sword. God had done a tremendous work. Verse 11, Gideon went up by the route of the nomads east of Noba and Jogbiha and fell upon the unsuspecting army. You would think they'd be suspecting by now. <laughs> Verse 12, Zeba and Zalmunna, the two kings of Midian, fled, but he pursued them and captured them, routing their entire army. Verse 13, Gideon son of Joash, then returned from the battle by the pass of Erez. He caught a young man of Sukkoth and questioned him. And the young man wrote down for him the names of the 77 officials of Sukkoth, the elders of the town, the town that wouldn't give them bread and water. Gideon's still mad about that. He's human. I, I get that. Then Gideon came and said to the men of Sukkoth, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you taunted me by saying, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Sukkoth a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars. That must have been so painful. He also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the town. We see the vindictiveness, the meanness of Gideon. You know, the Bible says in the Torah, Deuteronomy 32, 35, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Romans 12, 19, Do not take revenge, dear friends but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what the word of God says. Of course, they didn't have Romans at that time, but they had Deuteronomy saying that that's what's being quoted in Romans. But Gideon is a man of vindictiveness. And he took revenge on the people. I don't blame them for being hurt that they didn't support him. I also don't blame the people for being a little reluctant. It's just an unfortunate situation. But he got mean and vindictive. Watch that. Because his son Abimelech is going to learn from example and be a mean, vindictive person himself. You know, we got to watch how we're impacting the younger generation and the people around us. I heard about a little boy. He said to his mom, can I help dad go out to the garage and driveway and change tires on the car? And she said, well, make, what makes you think you can help your dad do that? And he said, well, I know all the words. Well, you know what he meant. He knew all the cussing words that dad would say while things weren't going well, changing the tires. He didn't realize it, but he wasn't being a great example for his son. And here, Gideon's not being a great example for his kids either. We read on. Verse 18, Then Gideon asked Zeba and Zalmunna, What kind of men did, did you kill at Tabor? They said, Men like you, each with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, Those were my brothers. The sons of my own mother, as surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword because he was only a boy and was afraid. At that time, it was considered extra disgraceful if you were going to get killed to be killed by a kid. But Gideon's kid is afraid. He doesn't, hasn't yet learned the vindictiveness and meanness and vengefulness of his father Gideon. 
Verse 21, Ziba and Zalmunna said, Come do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them and took the ornaments off their camels' necks. Verse 22, the Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us out of the hand of Midian. Well, wait a minute. Who saved them out of the hand of Midian? Was that Gideon or was it God? Remember, God uses ordinary people and ordinary situations to accomplish his extraordinary purposes. So Israel's theology is a little bit off. I like Gideon's answer, though. Verse 22, he said, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. So he's rejecting a worldly monarchy in favor of a theocracy where God rules over the people, at least in words. If the story ended here, I'd say there's hope for Gideon. But watch what happens now. Verse 24, he said, I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment and each man threw a ring from his plunder into onto it. The weight of the gold rings came to 1,700 shekels about 43 pounds, not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on their camel's necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, a stick, a staff, which he placed in Oprah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. So he just got finished saying, I won't rule over you. My son won't rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And now he's contradicting himself by setting up something that people are worshiping as an idol. So we see the vindictiveness of Gideon. We see the vanity of Gideon. We also see the idolatry of Gideon. This became a snare to Gideon and his family. Yeah, I got to look this up, but do you think the Gideon Bible organization named themselves after Gideon? You, if, it, if that's true, are you starting to think that wasn't such a great idea? <laughs> you know, maybe they should have named it the Ezra Bible Society because Ezra 710 says Ezra devoted himself to the law of the Lord and to the teaching of its statutes throughout Israel. So the Ezra Bible Society might be better. But anyway, verse 28, thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land enjoyed peace for 40 years. So God showed grace, even though Gideon was a man of vindictiveness and vanity and idolatry. God gave them peace because really this was God's victory. All Gideon did was kill Ziba and Zalmunna. Verse 29, Jerub Baal, Gideon's other name, which means let Baal contend with him. He went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. Gideon had many wives, and sorry, his concubine who lived in Shechem, in Samaria, also bore him a son whom he named Abimelech, and that is significant because we're going to be reading about Abimelech in the next chapter, and he is even more vindictive and dictatorial and pagan than Gideon was. You know, our kids are watching us. Are we being a good example or are we being a bad example? That's why I titled this lesson that. Verse 32, Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age. God was good to him. Unmerited favor. 
We don't know what the age of the good old age was, but it was a good old age, and was buried in the tomb of his father, Joash, in Oprah of the Abiz rites. No sooner had Gideon died that the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Bereith as their god and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They didn't remember that it was God who delivered them from Midian. And before that, from the Canaanites, and before that, from the Bashanites, and the Amalekites, and the Egyptians. They forgot all that. Verse 35, they also failed to show kindness to the family of Jerub Baal, that is Gideon, for all the good things he had done for them. The whole point of the book of Judges is that when you reject God as your king, you end up doing as you see fit, and when you do as you see fit, you become unfit. Is God your king? Have you asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life so you can be a good example, not a bad example, so you can be someone who lifts people up, not bringing people down, so that you can live by God's word of grace and love? rather than vindictiveness and vanity and idolatry. Give your life to Christ. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. You guys have a, a great day. It's Ash Wednesday today. Come to church tonight, 6.30 p.m., or watch us on Facebook Live. We're going to live stream it. We're going to be talking about fasting during Lent, the reasons why people fast, and how we can fast. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye.